Like a bunch of other people, I'm building a homebrew 8-bit CPU using obsolete 1970s-ish technology. And that means taking a whole load of these and turning them into a bunch of these. If I've got the stamina, then I hope to release a series of videos where I talk about the design of the CPU, some of the logic trips I've used, some of the ones I haven't, the use of Verilog to design and simulate the CPU before turning it into hardware, glitches, um, some of the tools used away, um, a few things I wish I'd known, and of course the CPU as it comes to life. There's a Hackaday project where I keep my project logs and a GitHub repo where I keep any design work, research or code that I've written. Anyway, without further ado, let's clear the stuff out of the way. This CPU's got all the usual moving parts. There's an ALU, there's some registers, there's an input-output device, in this case it's a UART, uh, memory address registers, program counter, RAM and ROM. Span one's a bit unusual in that there isn't just a single data bus around which all the components gravitate, there's actually four buses. Over here we've got the output of the ALU and that feeds around into each of the devices that's writable. But the ALU's also got two inputs which I've labelled A and B and each of those is fed by a bus as well. This ALU is actually a derivative of the one that Warren Toomey's put together for his CSC Von 8 uh, CPU, which I'll put in the um, description at the bottom. Now some of these devices, such as the register file, the UART and the memory address registers, can um, dump their value onto the A bus. Some of the other devices can dump their value onto the B bus. That includes again the memory address registers and the register file, but also the RAM and the ROM. This means that any operation in the ALU can combine some value that's been dumped onto the A bus with some value that's dumped onto the B bus and then write the result back to some other device. The register file here is actually a triple port device. We've got a single port in and two ports out. These ports are individually addressable. So um, a given register, there's, uh, there's four 8-bit registers in here. Any one of those can be dumped to um, the A bus or the B bus or the same value can be dumped onto both. So what does an operation on span one look like? Well, they all have the same general form. There's a value taken from the A bus, combined with a value from the B bus via an ALU operation, and that gets written back to the destination device. So for example, I can add the A register with the C register and write the result back to the A register. If I want to take um, the carry bit into account, I can say, for instance, add register B to register C using the carry the A plus B with carry in operation and write that back to register A. Or I could, for instance, um, add an immediate value of 10 to the um, high byte of the memory address register, write that back to the memory address register. Or if I just want to pass register A through into the program counter, I can just use the A operation. It just takes this value and writes it back to there without any other manipulation. The next thing I had to figure out was how all these instructions were going to be encoded. And so to decide that, I took some inspiration by looking at some other CPUs. So for example, I took a look at the MIPS CPU. Here's what the MIPS instruction looks like. Some bits in the instruction have um, been overloaded, as you can see. For instance, these bits here, in some cases, can be um, identifying a register. In other cases, they're used to identify an address. Over here, we can find that in one case it's a register, in another case it's an immediate value, in another case it's an address. So this overloading of the bits actually leads to some complexity in the decoding of the instruction. And that's something I wanted to avoid. I also took a look at the ARM thumb CPU. That's um, what the ARM thumbs instruction set looks like. They're actually 16-bit, whereas the MIPS is 32-bit, the ARM thumb is 16-bit. Now there's a hell of a lot more overloading going on here and you might think well that's going to load to even more decoding complexity but I think given that the address space fits into 16 bits you could imagine this actually might be pretty straightforward to decode through some some ROMs for instance. So actually this one's um, actually quite interesting and I quite like it. But as I said a moment ago I didn't really want very complicated decoding in my CPU um, and I looked back at MIPS and I said well We've got three inst um, instruction types there. What could you do um, to avoid a situation where any of these bits have um, multiple purposes? And what I came up with was this. Instead of having three different instructions with um, each bit um, being overloaded, what if we just have one great big wide instruction with some optional parts at the end here, which mean that we'd have one, say in this case, 48-bit instruction perhaps, um, where 
there's no overloading at all. Now this very wide instruction is pretty unconventional, I would say, and probably quite wasteful as well, because in a lot of the instructions, these values over here aren't going to be used. But it does mean that if I went for something like that, that I wouldn't have a great deal of decoding to do. So what did I actually end up with? Well, well, here we are. Got MIPS at the top, and here's spam ones incredibly long instruction, 48 bits. We've got some bits identifying the ALU operation, bits that identify the device that will be written to. Two sections here that identify the two devices whose values will be fed into the ALU. An unused section, a bit that identifies whether I'm doing register or direct addressing of the RAM. Here's a section which is optional in the instructions, which identifies a direct address and another optional section which is only used when I'm doing an immediate value. I like this um, imaginary MIPS instruction, this section here isn't going to be used on every instruction. And yes, that's inefficient, but it means my decoding logic is trivial. Each bit in my instruction has a single purpose. There's no overloading at all. There's no microcode or anything like that in this um, CPU. And by doing this, I'm trading one kind of complexity for another. Clearly, a wider instruction means more ROMs, but on the other hand, it means less decoding. The old 8086 CPU, it also had instructions that went up to six bytes. But how to implement this? I could take two different approaches, I figured. One was to use a single 8-bit ROM and load the instruction into a set of instruction registers over a sequence of six clock cycles. Or I could have a bank of six ROMs and run everything in parallel, fetching and executing the whole instruction in one full clock cycle. I decided against the single ROM for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't think that the wiring effort required for six separate ROMs will be that much different to having a single ROM and six instruction registers plus all the necessary sequencing logic. And secondly, loading six bytes in series takes six times longer than loading six bytes in parallel. So I decided to record my instruction across six ROMs. A definite downside to this approach is that to load a program into spam one's ROM, I have to mess with six ROM chips. So I may live to regret this. Or perhaps I'll add an 8-bit programming interface to the CPU so that I don't have to pull all the ROMs out the whole time. That would almost certainly mean adding a whole bunch of extra chips, probably as many as I would have needed for the other approach, but maybe it'll be more interesting. Anyway, we'll see. I can always change my mind on this.